All right, so in today's video, we're going to look at chapter 16, which is focused on process costing. So these first couple of questions are not actually in your homework assignment. So if you want to skip the first few, that's okay. However, I do recommend you watch them as it kind of breaks down the, the pieces that we're going to be doing in this chapter into a little bit more concise bite sizes. And then we'll get to the, the larger questions later on that actually pull a lot of this information together. So seeing it in this quicker rundown version at the beginning might help make more sense when we get to some of the more complex issues later in the video. Whatever you choose to do is perfectly fine, but just know if you do get confused later, it might help to come back to these earlier questions. So the very first thing then is this question tells us that Carlberg Company has two manufacturing departments. They have assembly and, and painting the assembly department started 10,000 units during November, and the following production activity and cost information refer to the assembly department's November production activities. So what they want us to do is calculate the assembly department's equivalent units of production for materials and conversion for November. Use the weighted average method. Now in all the questions you're going to see on the homework, it is going to talk about this idea of the weighted average method quite often. Technically speaking, in the chapter, there are two methods covered, the FIFO method and the weighted average method. However, for the purpose of this course, since it is an introductory course, we will simply use the weighted average method to make this a little bit more easy for you to understand. So what that means is anything in the book related to FIFO, if you're an accounting major, if you're going to move on in this, it might be worth slowing down, taking your time reading through that. If you have questions, please do come ask me. I'm happy to discuss that with you. But for the vast majority of you that are not moving on in accounting, it makes no sense to drill into you two different methods when one method is sufficient for the purpose of this course. So in here, we're going to focus on the weighted average method. If you are moving on, I do recommend you at least familiarize yourself with the basic tenets of the FIFO method before you get to, say, an advanced cost accounting course. However, in this case, we're just going to start down the line. So we are trying to calculate what is called equivalent units of production for direct materials and for conversion. So what this idea of equivalent units of production is, is say I have 10 units. So we have them arranged like you would say just bowling pins, for example. So we've got these 10 units, but at the end of the period, they're really only 70% done with respect to direct materials and conversion. So the idea of this conversion cost, or I mean of this equivalent units of production, is that instead of having 10 units at the end of the period, we would really only have these seven units. Because if we have 10 units that are 70% complete, that is the same thing as having seven units that are fully complete for the purpose of this analysis. So that's all we're doing here. It's just figuring out if we had completed the production of a certain number of units, how many units would we actually have given the costs and everything that have been incurred up to this point. It just helps us figure out exactly where we are at in the production process. So the way that we're gonna start this is I'm first going to look at the units that have been completed and transferred out. So in this case, if we look, we see that the units that were transferred out is 9,000 units. So I'll take 9,000 units times 100% because if they were transferred out, they were complete, which means that they have incurred 100% of, of the direct materials needed and 100% of the conversion cost needed. So in this case, direct materials has 9,000 equivalent units and conversion has 9,000 equivalent units. But we're not done yet. Instead, what we've got to do next is figure out the units of ending work in process. Now, once again, to prevent me from having to write out work in process over and over and over, I'm simply going to abbreviate that with the initials WIP, and that tells you that we are talking about the work in process. So the next step then is to figure out how this is related to our direct materials. So I will say direct materials. And in this case, we see that we have 3,000 units that were in work in process, 
And as far as direct materials go, they are 80% complete. So 3,000 times 80% is 2,400. Now for your conversion costs, this is once again the 3,000 units that are still in ending work in process, but now they are only 30% complete, which gives me a total then of 900 right there. Now, the last step then is to figure out my total equivalent units of production. So equivalent units of production. And similarly to how we use the initials WIP, I will use EUP for equivalent units of production from this point on. That will give me a total for direct materials of 11,400 and a total for conversion of 9,000 and a 900. So that wraps that up for us right there. And we'll now move on to the second quick study question. In this case, we're told refer to the information in quick study 1610, which is the exercise we just did. Calculate the assembly department's cost per equivalent unit for materials and for conversion for November. Once again, we're using the weighted average method. So the way that we're going to work this question then, is we're going to find the cost of beginning work in process. We will then add the costs incurred this period. And finally, that will give us the total costs. We will then divide by my equivalent units of production. And this, of course, will come from quick study 16-10 that we just did. That will then give me the equivalent cost, the cost per equivalent unit of production. So if we scroll back up, we see very quickly that my cost of beginning work in process was $996. And we see that right here. And we see that we added $10,404 during the month. So that gives me 996 plus 10,404, which will give me a total for 11,400. Next, we'll do the same thing for conversion. So this is 585 in conversion plus 12,285. So we'll take our 585 plus 12,285, which will give me $12,870 in conversion costs. Next, I will need to divide by my equivalent units of production that we calculated here. So that will be 11,400 for direct materials and 9,900 for conversion. So 11,400 divided by 11,400 then is $1 per equivalent unit of production. And 12,870 divided by 9,900 is $1.30 per equivalent unit of production. And so we see that there. So now we have calculated my cost per equivalent unit and my actual number of equivalent units. So here in question 16-12, we will need to calculate the cost to the assembly department's output. Specifically, we want the units transferred out to the painting department and the units that remain in process in the assembly department. So once again, we're using the information from 16-10. So the very first thing that we wanna look at then is direct materials. Well, how many equivalent units of production did we have for direct materials? Well, the of those that were completed and transferred out, if you recall, we said that was 9,000 units. So this is 9,000 thousand equivalent units of production and the same is true for my conversion cost because these are the ones that were completed now we'll need to multiply by the cost per equivalent unit of production so that is one dollar for my direct materials and one dollar and thirty cents for my conversion so nine thousand times one is nine thousand nine thousand times one point three is eleven thousand 700. 
Now, if you add 9,000 and 11,700, you will get 20,700. And of course, that is in dollars because we are looking at the cost of units that were transferred. Next, we need to look at the cost of ending work in process. So for our ending work in process, if we recall, we had 2,400 equivalent units of production for direct materials and 900 equivalent units of production for conversion. So I'll take 2,400 and 900. I'll then multiply those by the $1 and $1.30 respectively. That will give me 2,400 for direct materials, 1,170 for conversion, and a total of 3,570. An overall total then for 24,270 for the total of costs that were assigned. Now, in the next quick study that we have, we have quick study 1613. And in this one, what it tells us to do is to prepare the November 30th journal entry to record the transfer of costs from the assembly department to the painting department. So once again, we're using the weighted average method, but as we stated earlier in the video, that doesn't mean a whole lot to us because it's the only method we're going to use in this course. Now, the way that we're going to do this journal entry then is we have to remember the way that these inventory accounts work is we debit where the information is going to and we credit where it is coming from. So in this case, we are transferring these costs to the painting department. So this will be a debit to work in process inventory dash painting for 20,700. And I apologize, this got split down onto the next page when I imported this, so it looks a little bit odd, but we'll, we'll work with it. So then our credit will go to work in process inventory dash assembly. And this is because it is coming from assembly and going to painting. And that will be, of course, for the 20,700 that we got right up above for the amount that was transferred. So hopefully that makes sense where those numbers came from and how that journal entry comes out. So at this point, we are now through the information that is not on the homework. So now we're going to move into the more homework related questions. Hopefully if you took the time to watch that section, it will help you as we work through the following exercises. The first couple of these are really definitional type exercises. So we wanna make sure we understand what we're doing here. And then we'll get into more of the numbers type questions a little bit later on. So here in exercise 16-1, we're looking at the idea of process versus job order operations. So what this means is a process operation is something where we're producing a whole lot of the same exact thing over and over and over through the exact same process. This is something like Maybe we're producing nails, maybe we're producing screws, maybe we're producing bolts or basketballs or baseballs or footballs. Whatever we're producing is all the same, over and over and over, the exact same product. We're not making a whole lot of changes, not to say we might not have different sizes, right? We might have like a child's football all the way up to a professional size football. So there may be slight differences, but we can figure out what we're producing and produce that same thing over and over and over. Whereas a job order operation is much more specific. Maybe you've hired a contractor to come out and custom build your home. Maybe they're building a custom plane. All of these types of items tend to be job order operations. So with that basic understanding, now we're going to look at some examples and see if we can figure out if each one of these is a process operation or a job order operation. So the very first one is for beach towels. So for beach towels, does that sound like something where we're going to have to really figure out exactly the specifications of each individual customer before we make it? Probably not. So this is going to be a process operation. Not to say you couldn't maybe special order a beach towel, but by, by and large, this is gonna be a process option. Next, we've got nuts and bolts. Once again, that is a process option or a process operation. Lawn chairs, once again, process. We're not custom making a bunch of lawn chairs. Headphones, 
once again, probably a process operation. Now you see a designed patio. This is going to be a job order operation. Door hardware, probably just gonna be a process operation. Cut flower arrangements, this will be job order. House paints, once again, process. We can make massive amounts of each color of paint all at the same time. This is going to be a process operation. Next, concrete swimming pools. That is a job order operation. So we wanna make sure that swimming pool is made to the customer specifications so that they are happy with what we give them. Next, we're going to continue comparing process and job order operations. So in this case, we're once again identifying if one of these features applies to a job order operation, a process operation, or both. So here we have a cost object being a process. Unsurprisingly, this is a process operation. Measures unit costs only at period end. This is a characteristic of the process operations. Next, we have transfer costs between work and process inventory accounts. This is once again a process feature, and if it helps, remember, work and process is related to the process operations. Next, we've got indirect costs. The use of indirect costs occurs in both process and job order. Uses only one work and process account. This is your job order costing. And finally, uses materials, labor, and overhead. These are both process and job order operations. So if something in here did not make a tremendous amount of sense to you, do feel free to go back and read that section of the chapter and hopefully that'll help. If that does not help, once again, always feel free to reach out to me through email. I'm more than happy to help you figure out this stuff and make it make sense to you. But you've got to let me know if you're struggling. Now that next question then is exercise 16-3. Here we're looking at more terminology related to process costing. So the way I'm gonna work this is I'm just gonna start with number one, go down to number seven, and we'll just cross off the items as we go down the list. So hopefully that makes sense. Now we're not gonna start with letter A and try to figure out where it goes. We're just gonna start with number one and go straight down. So the very first item here says that we notify the material manager to send materials to a production department. So we scan through these items, A through G. The only one that makes a tremendous amount of sense here is letter F, a materials requisition form. And that's exactly what the purpose of it is, is to tell them, hey, we need these materials, please send them on over. Now, number two says we hold indirect costs until assigned to production. This is the factory overhead account. We looked at it quite a bit in chapter 15 as we began talking about it. And once again, we will be seeing factory overhead again and again and again in this chapter and in future chapters. So while we're thinking about it, I just wanna to call to your attention once again, the factory overhead T account. So hopefully you remember which side is the actual factory overhead and which side is the applied factory overhead from chapter 15. Well, if you do, then you will recall that the actual factory overhead that is incurred goes on the left or on the debit side and the applied overhead goes on the right side. So then, or is your credit side. So then if your actual exceeds the amount that was applied, you under applied. And if your applied exceeds your actual, then you over applied. Yep. Not super relevant to this question, but it's relevant in so many questions and it comes up briefly here. So it's worth taking a few seconds to just discuss it again, get that back in front of you. So hopefully you will not forget how that factory overhead T account works. Next holds production costs until products are transferred from production to finished goods. So once again, this will be your work in process inventory accounts. And those are another main account that we're going to be seeing throughout this chapter and future chapters. Next, we standardize partially completed units into equivalent completed units. So hopefully this one jumps right out to you as equivalent units of production because you even see the word equivalent in the definition here. So equivalent right there. So hopefully that one was pretty easy for you. 
holds cost of finished products until sold to customers. This will be your finished goods inventory account, that is letter G. Now, once it is sold to customers, it will move out of that finished goods account and move into the cost of goods sold account. So hopefully you've not forgotten that link that we discussed back in chapter 15. Now here in number six, it tells us this describes the activity and output of a production department for a period. This is our process cost summary. And finally, holds costs of materials until they are used in production or as factory overhead. This is your raw materials inventory account. And that is one of our inventory accounts that we've discussed. Briefly, if you recall, we said we have raw materials inventory, work and process inventory, and finished goods inventory. So hopefully that helps you there. So that's all we're talking about is this relationship between these different inventory accounts and the one that is being described here in letter seven, of course, is this raw materials inventory, which is that very first one that we're going to run into. Okay. Now here in exercise 16-4, we're gonna start dealing with some numbers again. So if you like the numbers, you'll love this question. If you don't like the numbers, well, hopefully you'll still like this question all right. So, in my opinion, the easiest way to understand accounting is to see it worked out. We can talk theory all day long. We can talk, how do you handle this or that? That's fantastic. It's worth the discussion. But at the end of the day, the way to really understand if you understand or to see if how well you understand the material is to put some numbers in front of you and see how do we work through this. So, that's what we're going to do here. So, what we are told is a production department in a process manufacturing system completed its work on 80,000 units of product and transferred them to the next department during a recent period. Of these, 24,000 were in process at the beginning of the period. The other 56,000 units were started and completed during the period. So started and completed during the period. At period end, 16,000 units were in process. Compute the production department's equivalent units of production for direct materials under each of three separate assumptions using the weighted average method. So, once again, I am sorry this does appear to have gotten split when I imported this. So the third piece will be a little bit funky, but we'll, we'll deal with that as we get to it. So, for the very first one, we are told beginning inventory is 100% complete with respect to materials, and ending inventory is 100% complete with respect to to materials. So in this case, we see goods completed 80,000 equivalent units of production. And once again, that is given to us here because they told us that is the amount that was transferred to the next department. Times what percentage? Well, if they are 100% complete, then that will be times 100%. Next, we see ending work in process of 16,000 equivalent units of production. So that is my 16,000 times what percentage? Well, we were told 100% complete. So for materials, goods completed, 80,000 and 16,000, which gives me total equivalent units of production of 96,000. Thousand. Next, for the second part of this question, we see the beginning inventory is 40% complete with respect to materials, and ending inventory is 75% complete with respect to materials. Now, one of the main issues here is the difference between this being 40 and 75. They're not both 100 as they were previously. However, because we are using the weighted average method, you don't need to deal with this 40% complete at the beginning as that is a characteristic associated with the FIFO method. So don't let that trip you up. Instead, you just need to come in here and once again, you start with the goods completed. That has not changed. You still had 80,000 equivalent units of production that were completed. If they were completed, they were 100% complete, which gives you a total of 80,000 units of product. Next, for your ending work and process, this is where the change occurs but you still have the same number of equivalent units still being the 16 
thousand that we saw up above. But at this point, they're only 75% complete. So you will take that times 75% and here with 12,000 units. And that gives you a total equivalent units of production of 92,000 units, slightly down from the 96 we saw before. Now in the final question, once again, we can ignore the 60% at the beginning, but we do need to deal with this 30% with respect to materials at the end. So to do this, we'll take our 80,000 in goods completed times the 100%, which will still give us the 80,000 units. Then we'll take my 16,000 that were still in process times the 30%, which will give you 4,008 hundred units completing or giving you in the end total equivalent units of production of 84,800 units. And so that wraps up exercise number 16-4. So now we'll move on to exercise 16-8. So in exercise 16-8 we're looking at computing equivalent units of production. Hopefully at this point this is something you kind of understand how it's going to happen, but this one gives us quite a bit more information, so we gotta be really careful not to get lost in all of it. So what I've done here is I've given you a table that will let you solve this. I've also given you a T account that will help you solve this. So however it makes more sense to you is how you can do this on an exam. But at the end of the day, you don't need to know both ways. One way will do this for you. If you feel more comfortable doing this both ways, by all means, Feel free to do so. So we'll just read through this and see how this works. During April, the first production department of a process manufacturing system completed its work on 300,000 units of a product and transferred them to the next department. So if we look down here, does that look like that would go anywhere? And I think that 300,000 will go right there. I also think on the T account, the 300,000 goes right there. Next, we are told of these transferred units, 60,000 were in process in the production department at the beginning of April. So this 60,000 is my beginning inventory in units, so 60,000. And 240,000 were started and completed in April. April's beginning inventory units were 60% complete with respect to materials, 40% with respect to conversion. At the end of April, 82,000 additional units were in process in the production department. 80% complete with respect to materials, 30% complete with respect to conversion. So, the number of units started here is not just the 240, but it is also the 82,000. This gives me a total of 322,000 that were started. Now, if I plug that in right there, that gives me my 322. 60 plus 322, of course, is 382. The question is then, how do I go from 60 plus 322 down to 300? So let's see if we can figure that out. Up above, we were told at the end of April, 82,000 additional units were in process. So that 82,000 comes out because that 82,000 is part of that ending inventory. So here's the deal. You could work this a little bit differently, but this is probably the easiest route to go. So this is how I recommend you do this, and it will help hopefully keep you on the correct path. So 60 plus 322 is 382. 382 minus 300 gives you 82,000 units left in ending inventory. So hopefully that makes some pretty good sense. Next we need to see the units completed and transferred out. Units completed and transferred out is 300,000 units, as we see right here, times, well if they were completed, that is 100% which gives me 300,000 equivalent units of production for direct materials and 300,000 equivalent units of production for my conversion. 
Next, we need to look at the units and in ending work in process. So the units and ending work in process is this ending inventory. So that's 82,000 and 82,000. We are then told that we are 80% complete with respect to materials and 30% complete with respect to conversion. So we'll take the direct materials number times 80%, the conversion number times 30%, which gives me 65,600 and 24,600. In the end, I see that I have 365, 600 for direct materials and 324, 600 for conversion. So that will wrap exercise 16-8 up for us and we will now move on to exercise 16-9. In exercise 16-9, we are once again looking at the weighted average method assigning cost to output and inventories. So in this question, we are told that we need to look at the cost of beginning inventory first. So when I do that, I see that my cost of beginning inventory is 118,472. And for conversion, that is 48,594. You say, well, where on earth did you find that? Right here, direct materials and conversion cost. Now, I know I go quite quickly through these videos. That is in an effort to keep this from taking too long and with the understanding that if I go too quickly, you can always re rewind the video, play it back, all those sorts of things. So if you do find these videos are a little bit too quick, don't ever feel bad to rewind and go back. Next, we need to look at the costs incurred during the period for direct materials that is 850,368 and for conversion that is 649,000. 296. In the end, this gives me total cost of 968.840 for my direct materials and 697.890 for conversion costs. Next, we will divide by equivalent units of production. So, in this case, we need to refer back to exercise 16 8. How many equivalent units of production did we have? Well, for direct materials, 365, 600, and for conversion, 324, 600. So we will divide by 365, 600, and 324, 600. And in the end, that gives me $2.65 per equivalent unit of production for direct materials, and $2.15 per equivalent unit for conversion cost. So what we then need to do is look at the cost assignment and reconciliation. So what we then want to do is look first at direct materials. How many equivalent units of production were transferred out? That is still the same 300,000 we saw earlier. Now that will be multiplied by $2.65 per equivalent unit of production for direct materials and $2.15 per equivalent unit for conversion. Now, please do notice this is really two separate tables. So these titles here, direct materials and conversion, do not apply to this bottom section. So don't let that confuse you as we walk through these next calculations. Instead, this left column is going to be basically our subtotals and this right column will be our group totals. So just keep that in mind as we work through this. So 300,000 times 2.65 is $795,000. And 300,000 times 2.15 is $645,000. Those two added together give you $1,440,000. Now for the cost of units and ending inventory, we will need to figure out those units that were in ending inventory. And of course, this is the total cost of 300,000 units transferred out. So the total cost of units in ending inventory, we need to figure out the direct materials. So for direct materials, that was 65,600. And for conversion, it's 24,600. Or I'm sorry, 20, yeah. yeah. So this will be 65,600 and 24,600. 
Once again, this will be times $2.65 and times $2.15. When you do that, you get 173,840 for direct materials and 52,890 for conversion, giving you a total of 226,730. This tells me that my total cost to be assigned is just the sum of those two items, which is 1,666,730. And that is the total cost, of course, of 82 thousand units in ending inventory i would caution you please when you get to the exam don't look at this and say oh my gosh 65 6 and 24 6 don't add up to 82 i must have made a mistake that's not what's supposed to happen here likewise if that happens that does not mean you necessarily got the question right it could mean you fudged some math around to make that work Whatever the case, not to say that's impossible based on the percentages and how everything works out, it could absolutely happen, but that's not what this question is showing you. This question is simply saying you had 65,600 equivalent units for direct materials, 24,600 equivalent units for conversion costs, but there are actually 82,000 units in your inventory. So that's this 82. Don't feel like these two numbers need to add up to that. That likely will not happen. So I don't want you to confuse yourself like that. Now what we can do then is figure out this was the total cost assigned. Does that equal the cost that we should have assigned? So if we scroll back up, we'll look and we will see that the beginning cost for... Oops, I went up too far. Right. Nope. Okay, yes. Yes, I'm sorry. It's in 16-9, not 16-8. They gave us this information actually in this question. So in this case, we want to look at the total cost that we should have assigned, and that includes the beginning inventory balance of 167,066. We wanted to assign the 850,000 of direct materials, so 850, 368, and the direct materials for 649, 296, 649, 296. And when you add all that up, you will come back to 1,666,730. ,000 and hopefully what you see is that the total cost that was assigned is equal to the total cost to be assigned. So that works right there for you. And so that's all we're showing here with this reconciliation is that these are the costs that were supposed to go somewhere. They actually did go somewhere. So we feel pretty good about the work we have done there. Next, what we wanna look at is a T account for the department one work in process. So what I'm first going to do is look at beginning inventory. This is 167,066. My direct materials for 850,368. And my conversion cost for 649,296. This gives me a total for 1,666,730. We then look at the amount that was transferred out, which was $1,440,000. And that gives me ending inventory of 226,730. And you say, where did you get that 1,440? That 1,440 we calculated right there. And you say, well, what does that 226,730 prove? And if you look, we're getting that as my ending inventory right here. And up here, we said the total cost of those 82,000 units in ending inventory should in fact be 226,730. So hopefully this shows you how you can tie these together to make sure, hopefully, that no silly mistakes were made. Now, the next question that we're going to look at is exercise 16-16. So in this question, the very first item is to look at the total cost to be charged to production. So the question tells us Elliott Company produces large quantities of a standardized product. 
The following information is available for the first process and its production activities for March. So the cost of beginning work and process, direct materials to, whoops, I never switched back to my pencil. Give me just a second to do so. $2,500 and conversion, $6,360. That gives me a total here of $8,860. And we got those two numbers there and there. Next, we want to look at direct materials for the costs incurred this period. That is a total of $168,000. Next, we look at conversion cost. I'm going to tell you this number is $479,640. And before I show you how I got that, I'm going to ask you, how on earth did I get that? Because if I look in this table here, which is where all the information is coming from, I certainly don't see 479640 anywhere. So the way you get that number, of course, is to remember what conversion cost is. And conversion cost is direct labor plus overhead. So this is 199,850 plus 279,790. And when you do that addition, you will get 479. 640. This gives you then a total of 647,640, creating total cost to be accounted for of $656,500. Next, we need to look at the unit information. So for unit information, beginning work in process was 2,000 units. Units started this period was 20,000 units. And so total units to account for 22,000. Completed and transferred out, we are not really sure about. They don't tell us that number directly, but what they do tell us is enough information to figure that out. So if I know the total units I need to account for is 22,000, I know the total units to be accounted for is also 22,000. Then I can look and see how many units were left in ending work in process, which was 5,000, which means how many got completed and transferred out? 17,000 units. Now, the next section of this question asks us to look at equivalent units of production. So for the units completed and transferred out, we had 17,000 times 100%. So here we're just going to shortcut that and just show us the 17,000. Now units of ending work and process, direct materials. We have 5,000 and 5,000 for both. As we see, that is my ending work and process. But what is different is the percentages related to those. So my direct materials have all been added. So I see that that is 5,000. But... For my conversion, I only have 35% of those costs. So that is 1,750. That gives me equivalent units of production for direct materials of 22,000 and 18,750 for conversion. Now, for cost per equivalent unit, I will need to look at the cost of beginning work in process, which for direct materials was 2,500. We then added in $168,000 this period for a total of $17,500. And conversion was $6,360 plus $479,640, giving me a total of $486,000. We will then divide that by the equivalent units of production for direct materials and conversion, respectively. So this will be divided by $22,000. And this will be divided by 18750 When I do so, I come out to $7.75 per equivalent unit of production and $25.92 per equivalent unit of production. Now, the last step here is to look at this cost assignment and reconciliation. So in this case, we see the cost transferred out. We will take direct materials, that is once again the 17,000 that were completed, and the 17,000 for conversion that were completed, 
times the respective $7.75 and $25.92. When you do that, you will get one thirty-one seven fifty and four hundred forty thousand six forty, giving you a total of five seventy-two three ninety. Next, for my cost of ending work in process, I see my direct materials are five thousand. And my conversion is 1750 And once again, we get those numbers from right here, 5000 and 1750 Those then get multiplied by their respective $7.75 and $25.92. And when you do that, you get $38,750 and $45,360 giving you a total of 84,110, which totals out to $656,500. Now, hopefully this number looks familiar because this is not the first time we've seen this number in this question. We see that total costs accounted for were 656,500, and if you scroll up just a little bit, you'll see the total cost to account for were 656,500. So if you felt a little uneasy about this seventeen thousand dollar, or I'm sorry, the seventeen thousand units right here that we kind of backed into, hopefully the math following through shows you that that is indeed the correct amount, as everything ties back together when we use that seventeen thousand. So that wraps up that question, and now we'll move on to exercise sixteen dash twenty. So here in exercise sixteen dash twenty. The first thing that we need to do is look at the information we're given. So it tells us high test company uses the weighted average method of process costing to assign production costs to its products. Information from the company's first production process for September follows. Assume all materials are added at the beginning of the production process and conversion costs are added uniformly throughout the process. So that works for us. They then tell us we need to do six different things. We're going to do this in a couple of different steps, so we'll jump right in. So the very first item here is units completed and transferred out. So if we look at the table we are given, we see units completed and transferred, 23,000, 23,000. Next, we see units of ending work in process. So you've got to do actually a little bit of math here to get this number. So I'm just going to come up a little bit, and we'll just do some math here in the top. Since all this got pushed down, this would normally have happened at the bottom of the page, but for some reason when this imported it, it shoved a lot of stuff down a couple of lines, so we'll just do this at the top. So we'll take units in beginning work in process, and that is 2,000. We will add units started and that is 28,000 units so you see work in process at the beginning 2,000 units units started 28,000 units minus units completed and you see the units that were completed as 23,000 units this gives me then my ending work in process inventory in units and that is 7,000 units so we'll now bring that 7,000 down and that will be in both of these positions because of the way the question was worded it told us that direct materials are incurred all at the beginning so we see 100 percent and we see that they told us with respect to direct materials 100 percent complete and 40 percent complete with respect to conversion so this is 40 percent right there so now when i do this i get 7,000 for direct materials 2,800 for conversion giving me totals here 30,000 equivalent units of production for direct materials and 25,000 oops 25,800 equivalent units of production for conversion. 
So that addresses points number one and two in this question, and now we'll move on to points three and four. So cost per equivalent unit of production, we'll need to figure out the cost of that beginning work and process, which was given to us in the table as 45,000, and for conversion is 56,320. Next, we look at costs incurred this period, that is 375 thousand and conversion is 341 thousand that tells me then that total costs for direct materials 420 and conversion 397 320 those then get divided once again by the equivalent units of production associated with each so this is divided by 30 thousand and 25 thousand eight this gives me a total cost of $14 per equivalent unit of production for direct materials and $15.40 per equivalent unit of production for conversion cost. Now we need to figure out the costs that were transferred out of that work and process account to those finished inventory accounts. And this is $14 per equivalent unit of production times 23,000 equivalent units of production, giving me a total of 322,000. And conversion, of course, then is the $15.40 times the 23,000 units. That gives me a total of 354,200. Once again, these tables are totally separate, so don't allow this to confuse you down below. So now that gives me a total for the amount transferred out of $676,200. Lastly, for this question, we need to look at the cost of ending work in process. So the total of that ending work in process is direct materials, $14 per equivalent unit times the 7,000 equivalent units of production, or $98,000. Next, for conversion, we've got the $15.40 times 2,800 equivalent units of production for a total of 43,120. That then gives me 141, 120. So 141, 120. And when you add those up, you get $817,320. So if you actually come back up a little bit and you take the 420,000 plus the 397, 320 right here, you'll get right back to this 817, 320. So once again, we've proved that the total cost accounted for was equal to the total cost to be accounted for, which of course is that 420 plus the 397, and it all comes back nice. And pretty and we have completed another question on this homework assignment so finally we are through with a lot of the math stuff at this point the homework assignment switches over from mostly computational to the idea of recording journal entries now just like in every accounting class you've ever had and every accounting class you ever will have most likely there will be a tremendous amount of journal entries in this course so here we begin diving into those as they relate to chapter 16. We're not giving you a lot of computations you have to do to do the journal entries. We're simply giving you the information and saying, please record the following transactions. So here we are looking at exercise 1621. And we are told to prepare the, per to prepare the journal entries below. So in the very first one, we are to record the purchase of $80,000 of raw materials on credit. So to purchase raw materials, where do they go? Well, they're going to go to the raw materials inventory. So you debit raw materials inventory, and that will be for the $80,000. Of course, this is an inventory account, so it is an asset. An assets increase with a debit, so that seems to make sense. And you've got to be a little bit careful here because this purchase is on credit which tells me that I will credit the account's payable account for $80,000.
Now, the reason I say you need to be careful is in a lot of questions, it will simply tell you they purchased $80,000 of raw materials and there will be a period at that point. And then you could credit cash, you could credit accounts payable, either one is acceptable. In this case though, they specifically mention that the purchase is on credit. Since the purchase is on credit, you must credit that account's payable account as a credit to cash would actually be incorrect. So next we want to record the use of $42,000 of direct materials in the roasting department. So if the roasting department has used them, then that means that they went to work in process inventory dash roasting. I'm just gonna write roast just to keep it in there, but you get the idea. And that'll be for $42,000. So where on earth did this come from? This came from the raw materials inventory. So a credit to raw materials inventory for $42,000. And once again, it's this idea of moving from raw materials inventory to work in process and then work in process to finished goods inventory. So it's just this idea of how this moves. So you debit where you're going to and you credit where you're coming from. So we debit the work in process account and we credit the raw materials inventory account in this case. And that's all there is to that. Lastly, we are recording the use of $22,500 of indirect materials in production. So if you recall back to our factory overhead T account, we said actual is a debit applied is a credit. So if we actually used $22,500 of indirect materials, will the debit or credit be to factory overhead? Hopefully you're getting the idea here that this is a debit to factory overhead because we actually used those indirect materials for $22,500. Now, where did those come from? Well, those indirect materials also came from raw materials inventory for 22500 And so that wraps up question number nine. Next, we'll move on to question number 10. We're recording the cost of labor. So here we incurred $42,000 of direct labor in the roasting department and $33,000 of direct labor in the blending department. And they even tell us here, credit factory wages payable. On an exam, if I tell you, please credit factory wages payable, please don't credit anything else. Now, I've given you part of that journal entry. All you've got to do is write it down or type it in. So make sure you do that and don't glaze over the question and not read the stuff in parentheses because sometimes it actually gives you the answer. So in this case, I'm just going to start by crediting factory wages payable because that's exactly what they told me to do. So credit factory wages payable. For $75,000. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Where did the 75 come from? It's just the sum of the 42 and the 33. So that works right there. Next, we need to figure out what our debits are. So in this case, this is 42,000 direct labor in the roasting department and 33,000 in the blending department. So I will simply debit work in process inventory dash roasting. and work in process inventory dash blending for the 42,000 and 33,000 respectively. Next we have indirect labor cost in the amount of $20,000. So indirect labor, similar to indirect materials, goes to factory overhead. And because this was actually incurred, factory overhead is being debited for $20,000. And once again, they tell us credit factory wages payable. So I'm just going to credit factory wages payable for $20,000. Next, we need to record the payment of factory payroll of $95,000. So if I'm actually paying my employees, what am I paying them with? Am I paying them in land? Am I paying them in food or am I paying them in cash? Most likely I'm paying them in cash. So we will assume a credit to cash for 
$1,000 and we will debit finally factory wages payable to eliminate that liability and bring it down to zero. So if you were looking at a factory wages payable T account, what you would have seen is 75,000 as a credit, then 20,000 as a credit and 95,000 finally as a debit, zeroing out the balance in that account and getting rid of that liability completely. So that finishes question number 10. Now look at question number 11. So here in question number 11, we are once again looking at journal entries and we're told we paid overhead costs other than indirect materials and indirect labor, $38,750. So if we actually paid those, it seems to me like we actually incurred those. So once again, this will be a debit to factory overhead. And since we paid it, we paid it in cash. That will be for $38,750 and $38,750. Next, we want to record the application of overhead at 110% of direct labor cost. So, in this case, we will debit work in process inventory roasting. and work in process inventory blending. And in this case, this will be 46,200 and 36,300. And the way you get that, of course, is to take the amounts you were given and multiply each one by 1.1. 1 .1. 42,000 times 110% gives you 46,200. And 33,000 times 110% will give you 36,300. Now, where does the credit go to? Well, this is the application of overhead. And when we apply overhead, we credit factory overhead. So that is a credit to factory overhead. And that will be for $82,500. And so now we are on to the last question on the homework assignment. Here in exercise 16-24, we are recording the cost of completed goods. So here we are preparing the journal entries for the following activities. So we transferred completed goods from the assembly department to finished goods. The goods cost $135,600. So that tells me the amount going to finished goods inventory. One thirty-five, six hundred, and the amount going to work in pro or coming from work in process inventory dash assembly was one thirty-five, six hundred. So we debit where it's going to in this case finished goods inventory and credit where it's coming from that assembly department in the work in process account. Next, we sold $315,000 of goods on credit. The cost is $175. Now, if you're taking a paper exam for me and I tell you just in some blank space, record this, I don't care if you record the cost or the sale first. However, if you're taking an online exam for me or if I've given you specific areas and I tell you to record the cost and then record the sale, then it matters. So make sure you read very carefully. In this case, it tells you record the cost of goods sold first, then record the sale of goods on credit. So what I'm going to want you to do is record the portion associated with the cost in that first section, and then we will record the sale where we actually recognize the revenue in the second piece. I tend to find this is the best order to do this most of the time because if you're going to forget to record an entry, you're probably not going to forget to record the one you want to record, which is the revenue. What you might forget to record or choose not to record is the one associated with the expense. So we want to make sure we don't forget that one and we get that taken care of right away. So when we sell something, the cost goes to cost of goods sold. So a debit to cost of goods sold, it's an expense account. It goes on the income statement increases with a debit and therefore will reduce the equity. So $175,000 right there. 
and that will come out of my finished goods inventory. So finished goods inventory, of course, is an asset account. So we are moving the information from the balance sheet to the income statement. We're reducing that asset balance on the balance sheet. So our inventory comes down. Once we've sold it, we can't sell that same inventory again. And the expense on the income statement is going up with a debit. So that completes the sale of the, or rather the cost portion of that sale. Next, we want to record the sale, meaning we want to record the revenue portion of this transaction. And because this was on credit, we're not going to be receiving cash. If we're not receiving cash, what did we receive? We received what's called an accounts receivable for $315,000. Next, we need to look and see where is the credit going to. Well, just because we made that sale, we now got an accounts receivable, but we also got something else that we like, which is revenue. So we're going to credit the sales revenue account for $315,000. AR is an asset. Assets increase with a debit and go on the balance sheet. And we have a credit to sales revenue, which is an equity account, which is increasing with a credit. So hopefully that makes sense for us. Hopefully this video overall has been helpful to you to help you get through the homework assignments. And once again, of course, if you are struggling on anything, please do not hesitate to reach out to me by email, and I will get back to you as quickly as possible to help you get through this material. So good luck. I'll see you next time.